Why, good morning, everyone. I am Nadine, and I am the Children's Director here at Living Hope Church, and I'm back this week with another object lesson. And this week, I brought Legos to play with. Um, so I wanna talk about how we can learn about our role in God's kingdom by comparing us to a Lego today. So a Lego was created um, to be creative with, right? To use our imagination and to build things with. But one Lego alone can't really do much, right? It wasn't made, it wasn't designed to um, be used alone. It's kind of pretty to look at. There's some fun colors and there might be some fun different shapes and sizes, but it can't really do much by itself. The word Lego actually comes from a Danish word that means play well. Now, you can't really play well by yourself, right? The phrase usually is play well with others um, or you play well with others, right? So when we have two or three Legos, we can kind of build something cool, right? But what if we had even more Legos? We can build even more amazing things. We can really get creative. The more Legos we have, the better creations we can make, right? The more that we can build. And so let's think about ourselves as we are Legos. We are a piece of, um, of Christ's kingdom, right? We were not made to be used alone. God gave us all these different talents and skills and abilities, just like every Lego has its own size and shape um, and design we have our own skills and talents. And when we put two of us together, we can do more. When we have three or four of us together, we can keep building. The more that we have, the more that we're working together, the better it becomes. Now, cool thing about Legos is there's eight little pegs on this one, right? If I had six of them, which I do here in my hands, um, a computer generated, calculated this up, that if I have these six with these little eight pegs, do you know that there are over 915 million, 915 million different combinations of how you can set these Legos up. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me that there's a lot of things that we can do in this world when we work together. We took all the Christians or all the people on the earth. Um, if we got together, we used all of our skills, we can do so much. Now, I can put these six Legos and create something fun, like some stairs. But you see, it's not really strong, right? I can't just stand this up by itself. Legos were made to overlap and we can change how they work by doing that. So if I do that right now with these Legos, by overlapping, when we overlap our skills, we work together, now I can have this Lego that does stand up. So I want you to think about this week. How can we work together? What are the creative possibilities of things that we can do um, for God's kingdom, to advance God's kingdom, to build? We have these great skills and talents that God gave us. We're just like Legos. There's so many possibilities and there's so many creative options of how we can grow God's kingdom and build something strong. Um, and so I hope you guys will take this lesson to heart. I hope you'll build something fun with your kids. Um, Legos are also great as you're sharing a Bible story to have your kids make out um, the scene, right, of the story. So, so many great things that come out of this, so many great conversations, but I hope that one of them that you'll have is how can we each use our skills, our talents, um, like a Lego, to come together and build something strong for God's kingdom. And how exciting will it be when we have not just six Legos, but 100 Legos or 200 Legos, when we all come together as the body of Christ to build something amazing. Hope you guys enjoyed this lesson, and I'll see you again next week. Bye.
shining lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Healing every heart I worship you I worship you Living Hope. Thank you for joining in this morning. Thank you for the awesome time we've already had in worship. If you would, go ahead and get your Bible, if you don't already have it. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 24. I want you to turn to verse 42. We're going to start there. This is going to be a precursor of what we're going to talk about in Matthew chapter 25. So go ahead and do that, whether it's a Bible or a phone or a laptop. Just get to Matthew chapter 24. As I've told you before, man, seeing the scripture for yourself is very, very powerful. And I want you to be able to see it as I read along through the scripture this morning. As you know, we're continuing our series on the parables. We're going to hit most of the major parables in this series. This is actually the second installment of that message series. And today we're going to talk about the 10 virgins. So hopefully you're closely there. If you're not, I'll just give you another minute. Remember, this is our opportunity to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Thank you again for being so faithful in your giving. If you haven't given in a while, go ahead. This is your opportunity to step up. There's an opportunity for you to do that, whether it's through mail or online. There's a variety of ways that you can give. You can see the information right here at the end of the service. So Matthew chapter 24, four, we're going to look actually at verse 42. I want you to know that this message has ripped me up all week long. And I think for most of us, you're going to find this parable that Jesus teaches downright sobering. In fact, you might even find this message to be downright scary. And I think Jesus designed it to be that way because it's the most truthful and honest representation of of what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. More specifically, who will actually be there? And there's a question that I would like to ask you right here in the beginning of this message. 
This question I'm going to ask you, I'm also going to ask you at the very end of this message as well. And here's the simple question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Folks, the Bible teaches that Jesus is coming back and he's going to want to know, are you ready? Matthew 24, verse 42 says, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day of the Lord when he will come. But understand this. <clears throat> if the owner of a house had known at what time the night of the thief was coming, he would keep watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So also you must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the prevalent theme in Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is saying these words for us to be ready when he returns. In fact, the whole chapter of 25 really has this similar theme. And there are three parables that Jesus gives in Matthew 25, he talks about the parable of the faithful and the wicked servant. He talks about the parable of the ten virgins, and he also talks about the parable of the talents. And again, they all have this similar theme. Are you ready? Are you ready? And this morning, I want us to turn our attention to the actual story itself. So Matthew 25, if you have your Bible, you might even just Turn a page, or it might be right there on the page. Matthew 25, verse 1. <clears throat> At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but they did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, they took oil in jars along with their lamps. And the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Literally, they were sound asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up, they trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet. And then the door was shut. Later, the others came and they said, Lord, Lord. Open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You see, the parable of the virgins is like many other parables that Jesus taught. Many of the parables are what I call sort of a compare and contrast. They're in this compare and contrast mode where Jesus helps us understand something by comparing and contrasting different ideas or different types of people. For instance, many of the parables compare and contrast the difference between those who think they're righteous, you remember the Pharisees who thought that, and for those who were sinners, like the tax collectors. Or, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe a parable about Lazarus and the rich man, which we're going to talk about in just a few weeks where there's a stark contract between a beggar named Lazarus who has great faith and that of a wealthy man and his absolute lack of faith. In this parable of the 10 virgins, there are two types of people that are listed. There's the wise and they're the unwise. However, the interesting thing to me is that though there's a distinction made between the two groups, all 10 of them have been invited by the bride to help prepare for the banquet. And at the outside, I want you to remember, all of them are included. 
There's no separation. In fact, all of them share the same privilege. I mean, to be invited to a wedding in that day was, was quite an honor. But to be invited to be a part of the bridal party, that was like the highest honor. They were part of an inner circle who would assist and prepare for this just incredible, joyous, celebrative event. So all 10 of them were in the same group. And I think understanding a little bit of the wedding practices will shed a little more light, help us understand a little more fully the impact of the story that Jesus just told. Some of this I've recently shared with you in a message, but let me just give a brief review and then shed some additional ideas or thoughts that are going to help us understand the story a little bit better. You see, the potential groom, what he would do is he would approach the potential bride's family about marrying. That is, if the marriage was not arranged already. The parents would then negotiate the engagement and they would settle on some kind of financial remuneration for this wedding. Then there would be a time where the potential bride and the potential bridegroom would have a time of engagement and typically it might be around a year or so. And then they would have the wedding. And after the wedding, rather than going off for a honeymoon, like I had mentioned before, the couple actually stays in the in-laws' parents' place. And that week, it's like an open house. People are coming and going. There's informal parties and festivities to further the celebration of this glorious wedding. The culmination of the week, though, would typically end in this huge celebration called the wedding feast. And the bridesmaids, or in the story, the ten virgins, what they did is they would assist before and during the week to help the bride, especially with the grand finale with the wedding feast. So the bridesmaids were absolutely essential in pulling off this wedding celebration. But I want you to know that, that the main character here is not the actual wise or foolish virgins. The central character in this parable is actually the master, the bridegroom, the one who's known as the host or known as Lord of this wedding event. And in this story, the bridegroom represents Jesus and the wedding party is his church. And one day he's coming, folks, and the church will have an incredible grand celebration a wonderful wedding feast with him in heaven. But there's an issue in this story, as we well see. This dramatic, glaring problem. Half of the bridesmaids are completely unprepared. And for most part, this is the main event and attraction. And because they're not ready for this, they're called foolish. They should have been ready but they were irresponsible. The other half were considered wise because they were ready and prepared for the coming of the bridegroom. So here's what's being described. The 10 virgins represent people in the church. All 10 virgins are considered to be a part of the inner circle, the congregation of God. And as a Christian, this would deem anyone who essentially has some kind of profession of faith. Those who would say, I'm a Christian, or I profess to be a Christian, or I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I think it's pretty safe to assume that these women in this grander story have made some kind of profession of faith. These are the professed, Christians in the church. We're not talking about half Christians and then these half pagans. These are all considered to be a part of the wedding celebration. These are all invited friends of the bride coming to celebrate the wedding feast when the bridegroom comes. The wise, they had lamps and oil. I mean, without oil, a lamp is absolutely useless. 
The unwise, they didn't have any oil. I mean, perhaps because the bridegroom was late, they expended all of their oil. I mean, I don't know what the case is, but we know that they don't have any oil. And in the interim, all of them fall soundly asleep. And at midnight, they're awoken by this public um, proclamation, this announcement. And it says, behold, the bridegroom is coming. The wise virgins, they trim the wicks of their lamp. In fact, this word here in the Greek literally means torches. Uh, so uh, most of us kind of think like maybe like a little genie lamp, but think of more like a jar or even a flat bowl that, that comes up but can be attached to like a pole or to a staff. So they have these torches, gives out great light. And these lamps were often used by the bridal party in a procession in which they would walk through the town announcing to everyone that the bride and the bridegroom were consummating or not consummating physically, but they were uh, having the great wedding feast and they were getting married and everyone should know that this is sort of the end of a big celebration. And so they would progress all through. So you could see them. So these were lamps not necessarily held in their hands, but up on a torch, giving light everywhere they came. You could see it from afar off. We know that in the Talmud, which is simply the religious uh, writings and saying of Jewish leaders, that when these wedding processions took place, typically they had 10 of the bridesmaids who would lead out in the procession. So here, Jesus, when he's telling this story, people are getting an automatic visual of what he's talking about. So the wise women, they're ready to go. They've got their wicks trimmed. The lamps are filled with oil. They're ready to light up and go down the procession. The foolish, they're caught off guard. They're unprepared. They don't even have what's needed. Now, in the story, what does the oil actually represent? You know, the Roman Catholic Church says the oil represents faith but it's void of good works because they believe that you have to have faith, but you have to do a lot of good things in order for you to go to heaven. So they were saying what was missing was the evidence of good deeds. Protestants have typically believed that the oil represents the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we see this in many biblical passages where oil is synonymous with the work of of the Holy Spirit. It's symbolic or em emblematic of the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can see this in Zechariah chapter four. Without oil, the wedding party was not ready for the bridegroom. So the thought is, without the Holy Spirit, nobody is ready for the return of Jesus. But let's not miss sight of the main part of the story, because I don't want you to miss the main point. Here's the point. There's a serious lack going on here. Whatever these foolish virgins are missing is what absolutely excludes them from the wedding feast. Now, on the surface, it's oil. But Jesus had a deeper meaning because there's a grim and devastating consequence for those who show up with no oil. These are the foolish virgins. And when the announcement of the bridegroom comes, the wise virgins were able to go to the place where the wedding is being held, probably some sort of building where the feast is taking place. The foolish virgins are caught off guard. And what they start to do is they try to negotiate with the ones who have oil. But the ones who have oil simply says, hey, I, I can't give you anything that I got because if I do, I'll probably run out. You'll run out and none of us will be able to go. So here's what we want you to go into town, get your own oil. Then you can meet up with us later and hopefully you can make it before it's too late. So the foolish virgins run off to go get the oil. But the troubling 
reckoning comes in the person of the bridegroom. According to ancient custom, those invited to the wedding feast needed to arrive at the appropriate time. After a certain time of guests arriving, the door would be closed, shut, and locked. This was to keep out any uninvited guest who might crash the party or maybe somehow disrupt the importance of this wedding feast. So those late, even invited guests, could be shut out from the joyous occasion. And when the foolish virgins arrive late, the, bolt, the doors are bolted tight. Despite pulling and tugging on the doors, they can't get in. And when that doesn't work, they start shouting, interrupting the precious event taking place. And they cry out, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. And when they said, Lord, Lord, this is very significant. Anytime you see in the scripture a name that's being repeated twice, you need to know that is a Jewish idiom. It demonstrates that the person who's calling out that name more than once has a personal, intimate knowledge of the other person. Fifteen times in the Bible, you hear a person's name repeated more than once. Remember when the Apostle Paul, when he was named Saul, the Lord cried out, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or David with his own son, Absalom. Absalom, Absalom, how much I love you. Or when Jesus was speaking to Martha, Martha, Martha. The foolish virgins, they're crying out, Lord, Lord, you are my Lord. I want to be here. I want to be a part of this special occasion. Come on. You know me. I have a personal relationship with you. I'm not a wedding crasher. I'm not a foreigner. Please, please let me in. The bridegroom just simply says, assuredly or truly, I tell you, I do not know you. You might have received invitations. You might have lamps for the wedding procession. You may have been helping the bride, but I do not know you. Jesus, the bridegroom, will say to people on the day that they see him, I do not know you. Previously to this parable in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is speaking on the Sermon of the Mount. And in verse 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, here you see it again, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I mean, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many, many miracles in your name? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see what he says? He says, I never knew you. But Jesus, you don't understand. I, I taught a Bible study. I preached a sermon in your name. I never knew you. But Jesus, I, I led a Sunday school class. I, I did good things for people. I even did it in your name. I ministered to people. I never knew you. And Jesus will say, I don't know you. This will be sobering and scary for anybody who gets that response from Jesus. This, this passage is even more troubling. Notice that Jesus says, many, not a few, not just some, but many. There will be many, many people who Jesus will turn away and say, I do not know you. 
Notice he doesn't say in the passage that I don't know you. He says, I never knew you. It's not like, well, I sort of knew you and, you know, I defriended you on Facebook. Or I forgot that you were on the list or I can't remember your name. Jesus says you were never known by me. When the bridegroom tells this to the foolish virgins, it's not that he doesn't have, you know, lost some kind of cognitive ability here. It's not that he's being forgetful. It's not that he doesn't know their acquaintance or their names or even where they live. When Jesus says no, he's saying, I've never had a personal, intimate relationship with you. Jesus said this in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I know them. And my sheep, they know me. In fact, it, it says in the passage, he calls his own sheep by name. It's intimate. He leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. There is an intimate relationship with Jesus. Do you know what the virgins were missing? They were missing out on saving faith. They did not have a personal relationship with the bridegroom, Jesus. These unwise virgins were professors. And I'm not talking about the kind that teach in universities. They were professors of a faith they did not possess. They knew about Jesus. They did things for Jesus but they did not know him. Now, I want to ask you a very serious, poignant question. Who do you identify with in the story? The wise or the unwise? You might automatically assume that you're wise because, you know, you go to church, you're listening to this message. You might call yourself a Christian. You might do good things to help other people. But let me ask, what if you are one of the foolish ones? Now, don't miss this. When the door's shut, it's too late. This, my friends, is a reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming back to get his church. The ones who possess saving faith, he is coming back. Will you be ready? If you are not ready, it's too late for you. He's only coming back for the ones he knows. So let me ask you this question again. Are you ready? That's the whole point of this story. If you're not ready, if you are not known by Jesus, you will experience judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. You know what it's saying? Once you die, there's no second chances. Once Jesus comes back, there are no second chances. We might not experience the coming of Christ in our lifetime, but folks, let me assure you, if he doesn't come back, we will all surely die one day. And when you close your eyes, and when you take your last breath, the next face you will see is Jesus. And he might say to you, who are you? And he may cast you into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place he described many, many times. And he will say to you, I'm sorry, it's too late. The door is shut. Take the weight of this parable very, very seriously. Examine yourself. Do you have a saving faith? Everyone is invited to the wedding feast, but not everybody is going to see it and not everybody is going to enjoy it. 
folks, don't rely on being good. Attending a church, being a leader in a church. Listen, wake up. If there was ever a parable where Jesus was saying, get up, wake up, get away from your slumber. Don't rest in some kind of false security. You need to be known by me. You need to know me. Folks, do you know Jesus? The better question is, is does he know you? I've never seen this parable come to life more truer than when I was a youth pastor and I was working with a teenager. His name was Kenny. Kenny had been involved in our youth group for several years. In fact, his dad was a Bible professor. Kenny was a part of our youth group leadership council. In fact, he actually did a lot of things, shared stories, did work, served the community. He knew the Bible backwards and forward. I'm sure he learned a lot of that from his own dad. I was extremely impressed with Kenny as a person and as a leader in the youth group. And one day, I remember him coming over to my house and sobbing uncontrollably. And I said, Kenny, what is going on? He says, I've never asked Jesus Christ into my life. I've just asked Jesus Christ to save me. I was dumbfounded in the moment. And I tried to reassure him that what he was saying to me couldn't be true. No one was a better model youth group member than him. No one was more religious in our youth group than he was. And yet somehow he completely missed it. He did not know Jesus and Jesus did not know him. Folks, does Jesus know you? Do you possess a saving faith? Trust me, one day there's an expiration and you're going to have to answer. And Jesus is going to ask, do you know him? You can know him. You can possess saving faith. And you can know that he knows you. But you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what 1 John 5 says. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, same word, that you can have this personal, intimate relationship with Jesus so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know. But have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Or are you relying on all of your rituals and religiosity and everything else that comes in the package of faith or religion? Do you know Jesus Christ? Better question is, does he know you? Don't assume that you're a Christian just because of your heritage, your upbringing, or your background. If the Spirit of God is speaking to you now, then I want you to open your heart to Jesus Christ. I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I place my whole faith and trust in you. I'm asking you to completely forgive me of all of my sins. I am trusting you to get me to heaven. Religion and all of its practices, some of it's good, some of it's bad, but it will never save you. Only Jesus saves. Will you call out to him? The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. It's a promise. And it's your first step in getting to know who Jesus is and having that personal, intimate relationship with him. Please do it. If you're not sure, hope in your heart, open your mind, open up everything about you and give yourself to him. If you've never done it before or you're unsure, I want to lead you in a prayer right now so that you can begin your journey of having that walk with Jesus. Say this, Lord Jesus, <clears throat> I know I've done things wrong. I know I have sinned. I need you in my life. 
I want you to know me. And I want you to know me on a personal level. I trust you with my life. I trust you with my salvation. I believe that you have forgiven me and have given a place for me in heaven. And I am claiming your promise that I can know you beyond a shadow of a doubt because I have placed my faith in you right now. Lord, there are many, many, many people that you've said will not enter into the kingdom of God. Help us to be a witness to those. Reveal your spirit to them so they can know. Lord, we worship you this morning and we praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you, and we'll talk soon.